Now we come to some of the sticky points, if that wasn't sticky enough, uh, talking about Canaanite wars and uh, servitude in the Old Testament. Now, we're going to spill over a little bit. We got started a little bit later, so we're going to uh, spill over into the, uh, the break time. As uh, Craig said, we've got a little bit of a buffer here. But <clears throat> Israel's uh, Canaanite wars, we need to remember, are not acts of genocide. We need to understand what is actually going on here. It's more along the lines of a corporate capital punishment that is going on. But the, there's even nuance here when we look at that. So let's take a look at the moral and theological significance of the command for the Israelites to drive out the Canaanites. <clears throat> for one thing, the warfare against the Canaanites was unique and non-universalizable. In other words, this is something that is commanded for a particular period of time and not for something that is, you know, for all, uh, it's not something, a command for all the people of God forever and ever, amen. You know, when, when some people will ask this question, I don't know if you've heard this sort of a thing before, how would you like it if another nation attacked yours? And they act as though God isn't in the picture. They act as though the Israelites are not uniquely set apart for God's saving purposes. And they just act as though, well, it doesn't really matter. Uh, you know, it's just like Israel is like any other nation. And of course, that becomes a huge problem. Uh, once you get rid of that significant feature, well then, yes, you don't have any sort of justification for the Israelites to drive out the Canaanites. But we have to also keep this in mind. Does the command, if a person says, how would you like it if you know, somebody said, you know, God told me to do this, to, to kill this people, to drive out this people or whatever. Well, does this command, alleged command, have the backing of all kinds of public signs and wonders, like the 10 plagues? in Egypt, the Red Sea crossing, uh, manna uh, on, the, on the ground every morning, uh, a pillar of cloud by day and fire by night over the camp uh, like it was over the Israelites. Uh, also, is the nation under consideration characterized by criminal acts such as incest, ritual prostitution, infant sacrifice, bestiality? I mean, this, this, it's not as though the Israelites are driving out the Canaanites because, boy, they wear tattoos and we don't, <laughs> or they eat shrimp and we don't. No, this is something much more significant. This is, uh, you know, again, things that would be considered criminal acts in any civilized society. And again, if you get rid of this idea that God is somehow not in the picture, that Israel is not, doesn't have any sort of unique standing in light of God's calling them and seeking to bring, use them to bring blessing to the nations, it's sort of like removing Gandalf from the Lord of the Rings. Uh, you don't have much of a story. It doesn't really hang together all that well. And so if you get rid of God and Israel's unique status, then you don't really have a story. It doesn't really cohere or make sense. Furthermore, we can say this, that if there is this good God who is all wise, who knows his, these purposes that are going to bring about the salvation of the, the, uh, to the ends of the earth, then he would have morally justifiable reasons for issuing this command against the Canaanites. So let me just you know, go on from here, and again, we'll just kind of fly through a few of these points. Remember that God is also waiting half a millennium, including 400, 430 years of slavery in Egypt. God said He would wait until the sin of the Amorites, a Canaanite peoples, was filled up when He told this to, to Abraham in Genesis 15. Also, the Israelites cannot enter the land until this time is right, when, the, when judgment the time for judgment is ripe upon the people of Canaan. God says that they, they cannot go in to inherit the land that He has promised them until that timing is just right. And God said He would vomit out the Israelites if they undertook those same acts that the Canaanites practiced. Indeed, that does happen. Uh, also, as we've seen before, God does not prefer judgment but urges repentance, and we do see people actually turning to, uh, you know, to the one true God. We think of Rahab, we think of the Shechemites at the end of Joshua chapter 8, these strangers who are actually part of this covenant renewal ceremony while Joshua is reading the law. Those are people who are Canaanites, who are aligning themselves with the people of God. Let me just move here now to a few distinctions that we want to talk about. Of course, we, you know, we, we need to remember this too, that if God is commanding something, He is not going to command something that is intrinsically evil. That is a morally 
metaphysically impossible scenario for God to command something that is intrinsically evil. God, for example, when He talks about the uh, infant sacrifice that takes place in the ancient Near East and even practiced in amongst the, the Israelites themselves, God, God through Jeremiah says that this is a thing which I never commanded or spoke of, nor did it ever enter my mind. Not that God didn't know that they would practice these things, but it's so far removed from the character of God that He would never command something intrinsically evil. So God can command something that is difficult but not impossible. So here we want to distinguish between three categories of duties. A lot of times when we look at the Scriptures, we think, oh, they're all on the same level. Uh, no, uh, kosher laws are not on the same level as loving the Lord your God with heart, soul, mind, and strength. There are some laws that are temporary, some laws that are permanent, some laws that are absolute, and some that may require a little bit of finessing in light of certain circumstances that override general duties. So let's talk about that a bit. We've seen that there is this command that is absolute to worship God, to love God. There is no variation on that, to not to engage in idolatry. Again, absolute across the board. But there are some what we call general duties that may on occasion be overridden given certain overriding considerations. So we think of deception. Generally, you don't deceive. But think about this. When you, leave, when you go out at night, do, you, do any of you leave your lights on? Isn't that deception? You're, you're sending the signal that someone is home when actually no one is home at all. Why don't you just leave your lights off, huh? Well, you're, you're anticipating potential criminal activity. We see that same sort of thing going on in Scripture. We see in the Old Testament, the Hebrew midwives, we see Rahab uh, who are engaged in deception in order to save innocent human life. It's kind of that Nazi question, hiding Jews. Do you deceive the Nazis? Yes, you do. You want to protect innocent human life. In fact, God commands this. When Saul is about to, when he's very jealous, of course, and, if he, and Samuel, who's about to anoint a new king in 1 Samuel 16, says, you know, if Saul hears about my going to Bethlehem to anoint a new king, he's going to kill me. So what does God tell him? He says, if anyone asks you why you're going to Bethlehem, say, you're going to offer a sacrifice there. Very convenient. Again, criminal activity, innocent life being threatened. This is justification for engaging in deception. Rather than saying, oh, you want to know where my friend, you know, who's running, you know, you, you know Emmanuel Kant used this example, the philosopher, you know, and if an axe murderer is running after your friend, Emmanuel Kant said you should actually tell if this axe murderer is running after your friend and you know where he's gone, you have an obligation to tell that axe murderer uh, would-be axe murderer, where he went, because it's, after all, you, you have an obligation to tell the truth to everyone, straightforward, uh, no deception at all, and it's on the axe murderer, it's not on you if you tell him where, he, where, the, where your friend went. Uh, no, it's a little bit different in Scripture. There is some shading here, and I think that that's where Kant gets a few things wrong. But anyway, I think we could say the same thing when it comes to taking innocent human life. Generally, it is morally wrong to do so. But there may be certain instances where taking innocent human life would be morally justifiable, even if tragic. So an ectopic pregnancy, when a woman is expecting, and the, the, the fertilized egg is trapped in the fallopian tube of the woman rather than implanting in the uterus, it would be morally justifiable, again though tragic, to take the life of this unborn one in order to save at least one life rather than losing two. Or if there is a terrorist uh, organization that hijacks a plane and the president or the prime minister says, shoot the plane out of the sky, even though it would mean killing innocent men, women, and children on board, we would say it would be morally justifiable. I mean, I, I think a good, very good case could be made for that. Even though tragic, could it not be that when God is commanding the Israelites to drive the Canaanites out, if there is innocent life lost, that God would have morally justifiable reasons for issuing this kind of a command. Well, I'd say God is best positioned to say, to have moral justification for this kind of a command. So rather than treating all these commands as utterly absolute, 
in every regard, we need to offer some sort of, I think, differentiation here, a kind of hierarchy uh, that is involved, a hierarchy of duties. Also keep this in mind, we're going to move on from here, uh, that the Canaanites themselves were warned. They had ample warning that this God had done signs and wonders in Egypt. They saw this pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. They could have fled rather than having resisted God. Another key point here is this, that the Old Testament's warfare texts aren't always as straightforward as they seem, along with other ancient Near Eastern war texts, that we frequently see this language of exaggeration or hyperbole, uh, leave alive nothing that breathes, utterly destroy. You see, when we see utter destruction, we, it's often accompanied by plenty of survivors in Scripture. Some people say, you're not taking the Bible literally if you allow for hyperbole or exaggeration. Actually, the Bible engages in a lot of hyperbole, a lot of exaggeration, a lot of metaphorical language. The goal is not to take the Bible literally in every reading, but where the Bible calls for reading it figuratively, we read it figuratively. Uh, we, we, read, we don't read figuratively the resurrection of Jesus. We read that in a straightforward way, uh, this historical narrative. Uh, all the Gospels are saying the same thing, etc. But when we read in Isaiah about the trees of the field clapping their hands, we don't say, oh, I'm taking that literally, as though I'm being more faithful to Scripture. No, that's, that, we take the genres of the types of literature on their own, and we treat them in accordance with the way that the author wanted them to be understood. Uh, that the beasts, for example, in the book of Daniel are nations. They are not literal beasts. Uh, you know, the, the same thing with the book of Revelation, a high degree of symbolism there. Don't say, I take the Bible literally. Maybe say, I take the Bible literarily, treating it according to each of its literary forms. And one of these is, one of those forms is the ancient Near Eastern war text, where we have a high degree of uh, exaggeration or hyperbole. Sort of like when we talk about this in our own sports, you know, we have kind of the sports genre. Oh, we totally slaughtered our opponents. Somebody get the police on this. <laughs> no, we, we understand that. And the same thing goes in the ancient Near East. We also have in these, uh, you know, this, this, uh, lang again, this language of utter destruction. As we read the, the texts, a lot of times people will say, oh, I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm going to look at how clear God is. It says they were utterly destroyed. There were no survivors and so forth. Well, you may take that literally, but why is it that you don't take the texts alongside them, very near them often, that, all, that go on to say that there were ample survivors? Why don't you take that literally? Why is it that you're only taking literally one side of the ledger but ignoring the other? So let's unpack this a little bit. Let's take a look at the ancient Near East briefly. Uh, King Tutmosis III, uh, he states that the numerous army of uh, Mitanni uh, was overthrown within an hour, annihilated totally and so forth, and is non-existent. Well, the historical fact was that forces, the forces of Mitanni uh, lived to fight beyond this into the 15th and 14th centuries, uh, you know, well beyond what Tutmosis III had claimed. Here's another example, the Bulletin of Ramses II uh, on Egypt's considerably less than decisive victory at Kadesh in Syria. Uh, in 1274, 1273. Look at the language here. Sound familiar? Millions of foreigners uh, that uh, he took no note of, that he regarded them as chaff. He slew the entire force, as well as all the chiefs of all the countries that had come with him, uh, that his majesty slaughtered and slew them in their places, and his majesty was alone, none other with him. So, no, nope, he was the only one standing. Everyone else phew, wiped out. Well, remember, this was not a decisive victory. This was something that was quite, uh, you know, almost a, like a stalemate. But yet here he's using this kind of sweeping language. King uh, Misha of Moab said, Israel has utterly perished for always, but the historical fact was this is uh, premature by a hundred years when Assyria would actually destroy Israel and that that would actually, you know, a lot of Israel's, Israelites would survive, would become a mixed uh, group. Uh, well, also, we need to keep this in mind that the primary command is to drive out the Canaanites, to dispossess them, which presupposes survivors. And this would work in two phases, drive them out and then kill those who are foolish enough to remain behind, who remain entrenched. Indeed, this is the sort of thing that we see in the, uh, in the biblical account, that the Israelites are going into these Canaanite cities, engaging in what are called disabling raids, according to Kenneth Kitchen, an, uh, an Egyptologist that they're going to these cities and then going back to their base camp at Gilgal. It's not as though they're just occupying these places. Only three places are destroyed by fire, 
Jericho and Ai and Hazor, but the rest are, you know, basically just disabled. You've got your, primarily your military people in these fortresses or citadels. And so there's this engagement of, dis, of, of uh, you know, of army to army. But then they go, once they've done their damage, then they go back to their base camp. And again, keep this in mind too, that the driving out of the Canaanites was not like some military blitzkrieg. It was, it was gradual. It was something that happened a little bit at a time. And we're told even though Joshua obeyed all that Moses commanded, like utterly destroy them, leave alive nothing that breathes, we're told that many nations still remain among the Israelites at the end of the book of Joshua. We read about how the Israelites lived among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. So this is something that takes place over a long period of time, this gradual uh, sort of taking uh, over the land in which Yahweh becomes the dominant name. It takes a couple of hundred years before that actually takes place. Notice this even in Deuteronomy 7. When the Lord, notice these three stages, when the Lord your God brings you into the land where you are uh, entering to possess it, clears away the many nations before you, uh, you shall defeat them, and then get this, number two, you shall utterly destroy them, but I thought you've already defeated them. Then it says, utterly destroy them. Then number three, it goes on to say, you shall make no covenant with them, but I thought you've already destroyed them. I thought you've already defeated them. What, what's going on here? It presupposes that there are going to be people around. Again, there's that language of, uh, you know, that language of utter destruction. We have to be careful about how we, how we understand that. Um, Ian Proven of Regent College says that this whole idea of, you know, seeing that there are these survivors that are hanging around leaves us to wonder, what is that term, utterly destroy, karem, uh, haram actually mean. So we actually see that, uh, you know, that these, in these three stages, that it seems to be, if you read it in a literal way, it, it's just hard to make sense of. There is a, a little bit more of a, a, you know, there's a bit more shading here that, that needs to be understood. We're even told in, in Jeremiah 25 that God is going to utterly destroy Judah through the Babylonians and leave their cities in everlasting desolation. Well, you get to the end of the book and, well, no, there are plenty of Judahites still around. Uh, there, you know, the uh, liberal, the, the, the urban elite go to uh, Babylon. Uh, a lot of people remain behind to tend, the, to tend the land and so forth. And we see that there is not that sweeping, utter destruction, but there is certainly economic, military, political, religious disabling, if you will. There, these, 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 these structures have been incapacitated.